So this is Dave. Dave, you got an extensive collection. Can you take us through the collection, and can we also start one of these bikes? Uh, yeah, we we'll talk about the first Harley right here. Yes. Fourteen, eleven K. Harley produced 1811Ks in 1914, and this bike was found in pieces. Most of these bikes were parted out and were never found as a complete motorcycle. The frame was found probably about 10 years ago. The engine was found about five years ago. Wheels and hubs years after that, and maybe 10 years prior to the front end. So these bikes come together uh, basically from pieces. There's only a handful, maybe two or three or four documented bikes that were actually used and and kept all through the years and through the two scrap drives of World War One and World War Two. You restored this one? Yes. I do all the restoration, all the painting. It's beautiful. Uh, I don't do any of the plating. I have that done. And, of course, the very fine pinstripe, we have an artist do that. So it's a representation of uh, their 11K. Uh, doesn't have race history, unfortunately, but as I said, he only made 79 bikes, uh, competition bikes, from 1914 to 1921. So if you do public math, I'm not very good. It's about eight or nine bikes a year. And, and so, just out of curiosity, one of the viewers was asking what the value of a bike like this would be. Uh, if it was original paint uh, with some type of provenance, uh, probably the bidding would start at 150000 uh, without any race history and being restored. Unfortunately, in a motorcycle world, that really devalues uh, the bike. Uh, I just had a similar bike at Vegas yesterday, and the bike sold for 55000 This would be a bit more because it has a, a more of a factory race engine, and the engines are quite rare. Right now, um, I think there's maybe three other M engines for 1914, so it makes it a pretty rare motor in this bike. Where did you uh, where did you find this and put it together? Uh, AMCA, Antique Motorcycle Club of America. They've been around for uh, since the 60s, and they have eight or ten swap meets a year. Everything at the swap meet is 35 years or older. Uh, so prior to eBay, uh, there would be blankets filled full of parts, and you would trip over them, or bikes, basket cases would be laying against a tree, and uh, you'd buy that. As a matter of fact, the frame is a 1914 basket case frame that I found in Connecticut. It was another a collector was just selling it, but it just so happens to fit the 1914 engine I found four or five years later. So that's how a lot of these race bikes come together. Uh, you won an award yesterday for this. Congratulations. Oh, yeah, thank you. I think best in class is what it was. The amazing thing I see here on these early bikes is that they really are motorcycle, mo motorized bicycles. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they are. And they have pedals. Yes. Now, what are the pedals for? Can you actually pedal this thing? It depends on, on what type of event it is. This particular bike, as most board track bikes, have a rigid pedal where it's actually uh, hooked to the frame with a band of metal, and they act as basically running boards. And the reason they use pedals, you have to remember, is 1914. Ten years earlier, there were really no cars even created, so all these racers morphed over from bicycles, uh, and they were used to pedal, so if you're racing a bicycle in the teens or uh, early 1900s, you'd morph over to these pedals. Some of the pedals will spin, like the Flying Merkel. You can actually start the bike. You go pedal it, the bike starts, and the pedals will stop, and then the engine will be running. Some of them get push started. It just depends on what venue you're at. These were death traps, though. I mean, as yeah, far pretty as much. If them. you fail, you got killed. They probably lost forty to fifty percent of the riders. Never lasted more than five years because you're doing eighty miles an hour with a leather helmet. Yeah. And uh, a lot of guys died from infection when they fell on board track. Uh, they got a lot of splinters, uh, big splinters, the size of your thumb, you know, right through your arm, and that led to septicemia a few days later, blood poisoning, and within two or three weeks a lot of these guys just died so they didn't really die on the track per se a lot of them did but many of them died at home in bed and and those were the pioneers of modern motorcycle racing which is still a dangerous sport but not as dangerous somebody wanted to know why the gas tanks or the fuel tanks are square as opposed to today's tanks that are it was around. just uh the manufacturing process uh, prior to 1915 it was easy to make a square tank and as metallurgy uh, got more sophisticated and they could bend metal without it cracking then they started to round the corners 1915 was the last year of what they call the coffin tank and then 16 as you can see in the other bike over there the corners got more rounded and, and more uh, I guess a, a prettier version of the gas tank tell us about the flying Merkel the flying Merkel is an interesting bike flying Merkel started in 1901 um, 
in um, it's beautiful by the way Milwaukee and Mr. Merkel and Mr. Evan Root who was the uh, outboard motor guy and the Harley and the Davidson brothers all knew each other and I think actually Harley kind of stole some of their ideas from uh, Mr. Merkel and uh, the outboard motor guy Evan Root um, this particular bike uh, was really found in Argentina which is a really interesting story with this bike uh, I pay spotters throughout South America and is, I actually, South America is a good place to find bikes uh, I don't want to say on live TV because everyone's going to go down there and be <laughs> buying bikes but they did a lot of racing um, all the factories went down to uh, Argentina basically in the teens to try to tr- drum up business and we all think in the 20th century thought process, but it's really the 21st century. So how did you get the bike there? This bike was made in Middletown, Ohio in 1913. Well, they shipped it somewhere where there was a steamship, and they steamed it to Argentina, which might have taken two or three or four or five months. And they raced, I believe, this engine in the Buenos Aires Motorcycle Club had a a very large endurance run in 1914 and 1915. And um, Flying Merkel won that endurance run both years as archival evidence from South America as well as the Flying Merkel 1916 sales catalog that has a letter uh, giving the hours, minutes, and seconds and the name of the rider that won the Buenos Aires Motorcycle Challenge or whatever they want to call it. One question I'm sure the Terrifics have, and I definitely have. What speeds were these bikes capable of? Uh, Pretty simple. Uh, In 1914, you're looking low 80s. In 1915, you're looking at really high 80s, low 90s, and uh, one advertisement from Excelsior, I believe that was made in Chicago, uh, they broke the 100-mile mark in 1916, and that was a big thing where they thought you couldn't go that fast. Considering that cars definitely couldn't, and the, uh, the Indy 500s at the time were being won with average speeds of like 75, 80 miles an hour. So uh, you, you have spotters down in South America. Somebody yeah. spots this? Yeah, well, well, what they do is they spot the engine in a few parts, and uh, they bring it out of Argentina uh, to my spotter into Uruguay, who uh, sends me an email that he has some Indian parts, some Henderson parts, and some Flying Merkel parts. And I was really quite blown away because what is a 1913 Flying Merkel doing? I think it's 43 degrees south latitude, 7,500 miles south of the United States in 1913. It's just uncanny. It shouldn't be there. They should not be there. But when you read some of the archival information that I've since discovered, there was a lot of racing in Argentina. And as I said, this bike or this engine, I think, won um, in 1914. And instead of shipping the bike back, I think the manufacturer said, hey, wait, that's really expensive. By the time we get this bike back, we'll lose our shirt selling it. Let's try to win the race again. So I think they left the bike, and they won in 1914. And then when Jose tried to load it up on the trailer or and bring it over to the ship to ship it back, the Flying Merkel guy said, well, that's two years old. It's beat up. Let's just sell it here. We'll take the two pieces of paper saying that we won. We'll advertise it all over the United States, which they did. And I hired another person from the um, University of Buenos Aires, an English professor, a her. And uh, what she did is I paid her to research it further, and she found documentation of the riders' names, the exact hours, minutes, and seconds that the Fly Merkel won, documented in a book. She interviewed the fellow who wrote this book. Uh, but unfortunately, his information came from the archives in Argentina, Argentina is um, having some recession going on, and archives is locked. The doors are locked. There's nobody there. You can't get in to find a VIN number. So my next step is to try to go to some piers uh, where there are ships and maybe try to find some of the shipping records if I can get a VIN number. A lot of work. Uh, Somebody said, is American Pickers still going on TV? And if so, have you ever been on? Uh, American Pickers, I believe, is still uh, shooting for... uh, 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 I, I have History ne- Channel. I have never been on American Pickers, but Mike Wolf and I are very good friends. Mike, if uh, you see me, send me a note. Uh, Mike and I have been in the club together for 25 years. What about uh, these bikes? Uh, this one here is a 1924 eight valve factory racer. Uh, these bikes uh, were produced by the factory just for the factory riders. They were never ever sold to the public. Uh, a road bike was about 350 bucks in a day, and the eight valve bikes are fifteen hundred dollars. They're made of unobtainium. Uh, it was Harley's secret weapon, and they didn't want anyone getting a hold of that engine. And when these bikes became obsolete, 
Yeah, they believe they only produce about 20, but Harley had standing orders because Harley factory owned these engines to have the engines destroyed, mainly the cylinders, uh, because of the overhead valve uh, configuration. And Harley didn't do overhead valves. Four valves per cylinder started in 15, but they actually made it for their road version in the year 2000 on the v rod So that's how advanced this stuff was. Well, um, so what would a bike like this be worth? Um this particular bike has reproduction cylinders, and the reason is currently there's only four documented eight valves in the world. One just came out of Australia two years ago, and it sold just at 500,000. So a real documented bike, you can look it up on the internet, about half a million dollars. We talked about motorized bicycles. None of these bikes that you've shown us here have any suspension whatsoever. Uh, yeah, they actually do. Um, really? The gray Harley Davidson has no suspension, but in that year they have telescopic forks. So if this bike was running a board track basically with no bumps, it would be a rigid front end. If next week they were running a dirt track, they would fit it with a clutch in the rear wheel, which this bike has, and probably put telescopic forks. Now, the Flying Merkel is so advanced that it has three inches of travel right here. So it has a Springer front end that goes up and down. And it is so advanced, there is an actual picture and the American racer dated 1924 of a factory Harley Davidson rider like this bike which everybody misses has flying Merkel forks which is unheard of Fly Merkel went bankrupt in 1916 1924 the factory Harley Davidson stole the forks and put it on their bike and painted them green wow these are flying Merkel forks yeah if you, take a look, you can see the they're the, they are very similar they're not very similar they're the same flying Merkel yeah. They're the exact right same. Yeah. Uh, can we? Can you start this one up? I sure can. That would be great. Okay. All right, stand by. Yeah, thank you very much. Dave has got some collection, huh? Oh, yeah. And well, it seems I like he's, he's dealing in bikes, too. Visualize riding on one of these things at 80 miles an hour. No, I, I can't. I, I can't imagine being on a uh, bike like this. I, I, can't, I mean, it's hard enough to imagine being on a bike, period, uh, at high speed, let alone imagine being on a, a bike on a, a wood track track racing that looked like this well, the in the early tracks, days. The other thing, the, we're talking about try riding motorcycles, racing motorcycles on what were essentially the same type of wood floors as a basketball court. Right. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And that's what he's saying caused so many infections. Yeah. And those days, the only antibiotic available was sulfur. Penicillin had not yet been pioneered. That came in the 20s. By the way, uh, Matt's not a doctor, but he did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. <laughs> That's common knowledge. I, I understand. It was a, it was a joke, Matt. Okay. Yeah. So you have to uh, you have to pump the bike a bunch and yeah you got to put oil in a top tank it's a total loss system you pump about three pumps into the engine and it actually blows it out a little pipe and oils the chain so if you don't pump oil into the engine it'll seize up. All right, so... So it's kind of like a two-stroke. Well, it doesn't burn the oil. It blows it out of the engine. It's a four-stroke engine, yeah. but it just uses the oil. And that changed in 1929. Harley went to an internal system that kept the oil more like an automobile and not blowing it out all over the road and all over the rider. I noticed you got uh, ear protection there. I feel like there's only ear protection for one and three people need it. <laughs> So what, what are you doing there? I'm just priming the engine so it's just easier to start. And sometimes it'll catch on fire. Oh, huh. all it's right. your job to put it out. Okay. My job to put it out. Who's busy extinguisher? I, I don't know. Actually, there's one right here. Okay. Come There's on. the extinguisher. This is going to be loud. I promise you that. You guys ready for this? This is going to be insane.
couple of things that's I was a, pointing out while you were racing the engine. Number one, yes. no exhaust pipes. The exhaust is coming out right at your right leg. Yeah, yeah, Harley actually went in the wrong direction. On the 1916, they had very short pipes, mm -hmm. and they thought a very short wheelbase would handle better, which really is incorrect, and no pipes would work better, which is really incorrect. But you have to remember the year. Uh, early 20s, they were still experimenting. Um, I've raced this bike in uh, Washington, Ohio at the Fulton County Fairgrounds, and I'll tell you something. It is... It's a scary, scary machine. You've raced this bike? Yeah, You're I've had your two major <laughs> fires with the bike. And as you can see, this port right here burns the back of your leg and then you're you're really racing in the heat of battle with other people. It's a real race. My old motocross days um, give me flashbacks to catch the guy in front of me and then your leg is hurting you a little bit and then when you get into the pits you know with the race you take your boot off i mean i had almost a third degree burn and it took three months to heal and you don't really feel that and i raced it a second time and almost got the same thing uh catastrophic fire because of the open ports if there's any fuel anywhere instant fire i've had two of them I like how you, you stuck your hand over the thing, even though you said there might be a fire over there. There were flames coming out, and the the Terrifics wanted to know. They've got a lot of questions. How bad are the brakes? Uh, and then um, is there any place to put your legs and rest your legs? And your legs are right next to the chains. They're also, as you noticed, uh, right next to the uh, ex exhaust. And, yeah. And, and um, chains on one to side. To answer some questions, uh, it doesn't have brake brakes. Uh, up until even today, when you race flat track, they don't have brakes. They're not required, and they're actually banned from the track. How would you brake? You don't need brakes. Well, you have over here a uh, timing control where you go into the corner, and you roll off the throttle. You retard it, which slows you down, or you just hit the kill button, and that bogs the bike down and slows you down. Uh, anybody who does that is not going to win. You want to go into the corner at full throttle uh, into a power slide. Otherwise, you're non-competitive. The Harley racers did one of two things. They won or they died. And when you think you're getting 200 to 300 dollars a year in salary for a farmer or someone working in an automotive plant or a field, they could win a thousand dollars in one day. They were the first American junkies on adrenaline. First yeah. American adrenaline junkies were these guys, and they were walking home with three, four, five hundred dollars a race. There's a five mile race, a ten mile race, a twenty five mile race, a hundred mile race, and then the final three hundred mile race. They were the rock stars of the world. Over ten thousand spectators to see these guys do what they do. They and in New York, are. New Jersey in nineteen twelve, they killed eight people in one race. Wow. Five spectators and two riders. The Isle of Man, they still lose three riders a year on yeah. average. Yeah. They're adrenaline junkies. So what about the, the, is there any place to put your legs while you're riding? Uh, well, and, and then right your legs on, are right, right on the, the pedals yeah. uh, is, is what you do. And a lot of them, 80, 90% at this point would have a big pillow here. There was a lot of uh, uh, pictures of guys bleeding from the nose and knocking their teeth out on the handlebars. Uh, because, again, most of the bikes are rigid with no suspension. And then what color was this originally? It was green? Uh, it was olive drab. Harley adopted that in 1917. They got the contract to produce military motorcycles. Harley being kind of like Henry Ford said, hey, we're going to paint our bikes one color. It's just a lot easier because painting in the day was problematic. So military bikes were olive drab with no shine. 1917 up until the early 20s, all the bikes were olive drab but shiny if they were a road bike. And, and is there anything special about these two bikes uh, that we should know about? Well, this is a 1915 uh, Harley, basically, road bike uh, that ran the Motorcycle Cannonball in 2010. I personally rode this from Kitty Hawk, North Carolina. We dipped our hand in the ocean or our feet, and we drove it all the way to Los Angeles, uh, dipped our feet in the ocean, the Pacific Ocean on this bike, traveled 3,294 miles, a perfect score without a breakdown. Every mile is a point. It got 3,294 points, so it technically tied for first place. But the earlier the bike, they gave more precedent to. 1913 had the same score, that took first. 1914 had the same score, took second. And there were eight 1915, so they all tied in that order. And, oh, and also, so would yeah. this have been the same style of bike that would have been a, uh, that, that would have been a service bike in World War I? Uh, Basically, no. Uh, yes, yes and no. A World War One would have basically been been gas tanks like that, but basically the same bike, 
painted green with a uh, rounded tank. So basically the same road going machine. Very cool. Thank well, you very much. We're starting to see the modern bike take shape with this one, is it? Don't we? Running boards, transmission, yep. and brakes. Well, I have another question here. You have two levers. Yes. What you're shifting do? here. That's okay. your, you're not here's, shifting with the pedals, right? Here's the beauty right? of the two levers. Now, I didn't know what this lever was. I mean, I knew it worked the clutch. So you have a clutch that's go, that's neutral, and the lever moves. So why would you need the lever? And you would never find out, and I was baffled for a number of years until I was on actually on Block Island on 1917. I remember Harley did not have a front brake until 1929. So this brake was added as a safety feature for the cannonball. So I'm on Block Island, and I'm on a hill. Well, there's a brake pedal there. Now I have to put my foot down. Now the light's going to turn green, and I'm thinking, well, how am I going to put it in gear? It's in gear, but how am I going to step on the clutch without falling over? So I said to my wife, you have to get off. And then I felt this little bally thing, and I go, oh, look, if I go like this and I give it a little bit of gas... I'll start up the hill, and then I can pick my foot up, and that's what that rod is for. It's for sitting on a hill with your right foot on the brake, your left foot holding you up. A hill holder. Well, exactly. You don't have to pick your foot up to start use the clutch because it's connected. Essa Game says this is a lot of technology for 1914, uh, 1915. I'm very surprised by that. Didn't know they had all this technology. Yeah. They, they, this was a ton of technology back then. Yeah, and every year it, it was uh, ahead of itself in light years. 1916 was so much better. 1917 was so much better. 1918 was so much better. Uh, you know, every year just got better until AMF took over. Then it all went to whatever you want to call it. Well, and if you want to hear this one, Ron, I could start. Oh, yeah. You guys. Well, okay. Sure. Why not? Here, I got, I'll get that. That's great. Almost every day. Now, is this one easier to start, or is it the same process? Um, so it's, it's a derivation. It's of, the same of, process. Uh, I could you know, take it. An Eastern dialect. I can try to test it. So we started to make it easier uh, fun for the crowd. Not like, oh wow, really it's not going to start. Take kind of the Got it. So he can the, kick the, it. It's the same yeah. system as the other one, but he could kick start this one. But it's easier to uh, do it that way. So he's going to do it that way. That's one of the reasons why we'll let you start on later. This one starts right up, though. Yeah. Very nice. Again, I, I can't even imagine riding this, let alone Steve, that. Got a, this bike has a much milder cam. As you can see, it's idling, where this bike does not really want to idle. All this bike wants to do is go flat out and, and burn up your butt. This bike is very user-friendly, has a throttle like a normal motorcycle, as a spark advance, basically go slow, go fast, and a three-speed gearbox. It's awesome. This obviously was a lot easier to start up as well. Yes. And it has a very high-tech system to shut it off. You just choke it. It actually has a uh, compression release, but I need to adjust it a little bit more, and it, it needs to be adjusted every thousand miles or so, otherwise it doesn't really work. How'd you get so into bikes? Uh, in second grade, my dad bought me a mini bike, and I was just crazy, rode motocross. What kind? Uh, he, Sears and Robux. Oh, there you go. Yeah. With the Cubs engine in it? Uh, I believe so. Rode that until I burned up the motor. Then when I was in uh, third or fourth grade, dad bought me a Suzuki 90, which was too big, so he could ride it, and then I grew into the Suzuki 90, started racing motocross, here in District 2 in New England in the 70s, uh, rode amateur, novice expert, and then went for a professional license. But that, I never actually took possession of the license because I had to travel all over the world for the, the season. I could ride one or two races in the United States, but then I had to go to Australia or New Zealand or Europe, and I didn't have a sponsor, didn't have the money, and uh, ended up knocking all my teeth out. I almost had a sponsorship for OSA and uh, just morphed into road bikes and then into vintage stuff. And do you uh, have any modern bikes or, or for you personally? Uh, I have um, some of my motocross bikes that I've ridden in the 70s, but no, um, I have some big Harleys, Heritage Softail. But with all the texting going on, uh, I've got some kids, a house and a mortgage, I decided 
to sell those bikes. And I, I do rallies with the vintage stuff on dirt roads. I stay off the main highways right now. So my kids, kids get a little bit older. But as I said, I've been riding since I've been in second grade. I do trials. I don't compete anymore. I did the competition back in the 90s. And uh, now uh, my daughter and I just bop around in two beta trials bikes. I have five acres and rocks. And so I, I, wow. I'm always involved in the flat track race. Uh, uh, all of you watching Trog, the race of gentlemen. Yes. Is next weekend, Wildwood, New Jersey. I'll be there on the 16. I'll be there on the 24. I've never raced in the sand. I got the skinny tires, but I keep myself, you know, in, in the vintage stuff. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, Banana Switch said, this has a tasty sound. So I like that. Thank you so yeah, much, Dave. Yeah, Great to welcome. see you. Well, thank Good you luck much. next weekend. Okay. And uh, congratulations thank here you. with the, uh, the, the winner. Okay. I like it.